By clicking on this video, I could already tell you, like me, probably have a love-hate relationship with your Tilta Hydra alien arm. But by the end of this video, we're gonna change all of that. Let's get into it. Now, first and foremost, we gotta set realistic expectations when it comes to the Tilta Hydra alien arm. We can't compare it to a black unicorn, a pro aim, or a Russian arm that goes on a proper camera car. We're using this little tiny $1,300, I think it might even be cheaper now, arm compared to like six figure arms plus like almost another six figure camera car, all right? Like, let's get that. But now when it comes to action pack car sequences or anything on wheels using the Tilta Hydra arm, we only need a handful of seconds of stabilized footage. However, we can get longer takes and here are some tips in which we use to make sure on every shoot we go down this checklist before we roll tape. Now, Tilta recommends to balance the camera and lens before installing onto the Tilta Hydra arm. However, I've seen YouTubers put it on the Hydra arm and balance it once it's on there. We've done both and haven't seen a difference. However, you want to run a calibration. So whether you do it on the app or you hold that front trigger and the M button down until it starts vibrating, do a calibration so the gimbal can properly calibrate each motor and put necessary power to each one. But we're not done just there. After the calibration, go into the app and boost your strength of the motors another 10%. This helps us out a ton. All right, now pro tip, we like to run zoom lenses. And I know you guys have heard before to balance a zoom lens at the middle of the focal range. However, this isn't true. My 24 to 70 G Master Mark II, when I extend the barrel out, that distance at 70 millimeters, half of that is actually at 50. I know some people do 70 millimeters divided by two, that's 35, but there's actually a difference in the extension of the tube of your lens that you're using, the zoom lens, right? So you want to zoom all the way out and then creep it back to what looks about the halfway mark. And on this specific lens that we like to use, it's actually at 50 millimeters. So I'll balance it at 50. And then I don't have any issues doing the whole 24 to 70 zoom range while mounted on the Hydra arm. Now we don't wanna stop there. When using heavier lenses or zoom lenses, your Ronin RS2 or 3 should have super smooth. Let's enable that to give us a little bit more stabilization. Next, go into your camera, no matter which one you're using, and if it has IBIS or in-body image stabilization, cut that right off. Cause we don't want digital stabilization to be fighting not only the gimbal, but our dampener on the Hydra arm and our spring end dampener on the arm itself. See, like we don't want that fighting with each other. Now, another thing I noticed is the arm likes heavier camera setups. So our FX6 or our Komodo setups perform better than our FX3. Why is this? I think it's because the arm spring and dampener is actually too strong. I don't really think Tilta took this into consideration. Now, on their install video, they say put two V mounts and or use those counterweights. But what we like to use is one fat V mount and we bought even more counterweights that we put when we take that V-mount plate off so we could give our FX3 a lot more weight. Then we could go to our spring and our dampener and put more tension and get the proper bouncing motion that's required from this arm. When there's not enough weight, and we drop it so that it's level with the ground, like how they show in the install video. Sometimes if it's too light, we notice that we're hitting the bump stop and it just stays there. It doesn't drop back down no matter how loose we set the spring to. So using those quarter 20 threads when we slide that second V-mount plate is a nice attachment spot. Now after a ton of trial and error with our two Hydra arms and being that there's really not much info on how to properly adjust the spring and the shock dampener on the arm itself. I mean, bro, we've watched that Tilta video so many times. Here's what we found out. Take the dampener knob, put it all the way to the lightest setting. We don't want to add any more stiffness or friction unless this arm's really heavy. Does that make sense? Next, what we wanna do is adjust the spring. We want the arm to drop parallel with the ground and be perfectly level. So I'm gonna just keep twisting the tension spring until it drops nice and evenly. Now, Tilta recommends if you go on bumpier terrain, then you start adjusting that shock mount. And usually one or two clicks gives it too much stiffness that we've noticed 
even then. So just be mindful of this. Now, something that's really mind blowing that people may not consider is the camera car matters just as much as the car that you're filming, right? Your mom's old Volvo or your homeboy Slam Scion XB with some stiff suspension, that's not gonna cut it. Just because we have a gimbal and an arm doesn't mean that the car can't introduce micro jitter shakes and vibrations. So go with a nice nimble car, preferably newer. We want that newer suspension to help us. And another thing is when we use a proper camera car, we use that camera car to accentuate different movements like wraparounds, flybys, all different types of things, crossovers. We can use our camera car driver and his experience with headsets on communicating with that driver say in the porsche right and we could do a countdown three two one we're gonna cross over okay ready three two one and then the camera car accentuates that crossover while i'm inside with the controller panning really getting a nice crisscross movement so as you develop your skill set using different arms or automotive cinematography, you're gonna realize that that camera car is just as important as the one that you're filming because if your camera car driver knows how to communicate and knows how to do those movements, working with your car driver, your hero car driver, you could get some really badass shots. Now, another thing I wanna mention is your arm placement matters and so does the speed. And these two tips kind of work in cahoots with one another. So let's go over the placement of the arm and then I'll go over the speeds in which we're usually driving. As we know, mounting it on the front or side, we're gonna get a lot more wind resistance than behind the car. It's just natural. The car is blocking the wind. On the side, it's exposed and same with the front. So 95% of the time, I'm filming from the back of the car, but it might not be exactly where you think. Now, you can mount it dead center in the back and get great tracking shots. However, try mounting it on the passenger rear quarter. Now, you're going to get a little bit of wind resistance, but that's okay. We haven't had any issues going certain speeds that I'm going to talk about in a second. However, you can cheat and get a little bit of a front 45 lead shot full wraparound and your rears when you have it mounted on the corner of the rear passenger versus dead center. So this gives us the ability to have more options for those more dynamic shots that I was just talking about utilizing that camera car. But when we mount it on the front, we're getting more jitters. So here's the speeds in which we normally drive. Now, a lot of these cuts are gonna be fast paced two to maybe three, four seconds. So I don't need stabilized long clips that are like minutes long, right? But what I want is when we do those movements or those aggressive movements, I want that shit stabilized. The speeds in which we normally go are anywhere from, believe it or not, 35 miles an hour to 45 when mounted on the front and the side. And we use our camera car and our film hero car to accentuate the speed by doing more dynamic movements. Now, when we have it mounted on the back, we could go a little bit faster. 55 to 65 usually gets us stable shots, but we'll watch playback on a bigger monitor just to make sure throughout the shoot that we're not getting these micro jitters. And if we are, we adjust the speed. So you probably are wondering what type of isolator we're using, being that there's some modified ones you've probably seen when watching YouTube videos or in the forums or just looking up Tilta's aftermarket one. We played with everything. We have two of the softer ones, the aftermarket ones, and they do help a ton, but they're still not perfect. And right now we're currently CNCing our own custom isolator. We're doing the same method with the stainless steel braided cables that are coated with plastic. We've tried four, six and eight inch. Six inch definitely helps the best that we've noticed so far. And what we're doing to mount those cables are instead, and I'll leave links in the description if you guys wanna see how other people have modified theirs. Instead of using hardware, we just had our frame of our top and bottom plate when separated, traced out, and we've been able to make a CNC version of a plate that'll have some little screw holes that we could bite down to on the cables. That just makes it look a little bit more OEM, but it still does the same thing and the results are great. So if you guys want, let me know if you have any questions on the custom isolator or some tips and tricks in which you're using to get the most out of your Tilta Hydra alien arm. I'll answer any questions in the comments and anything like that. Just let me know and I'd be more than happy to 
chat with you guys about it. If you thought this video is helpful, leave a thumbs up, leave a like. It helps the channel a ton now that I'm trying to get back into the consistency here. And yeah, just follow those steps. Let me know how it goes and you should have stabilized footage in no time. And until next time, I'm Jason Anthony. Peace out.